we left off with Jesus giving his disciples what we call the Olivet Discourse. It's where he answers specific questions that the disciples had for him about when would the uh, temple be destroyed, because Jesus talked about it, not one stone would be upon another, when Jerusalem would be destroyed. He talked about the, the signs of the end times. He talked about the Antichrist coming on the scene, going into the rebuilt temple, which is the abomination of desolation. He talked about his second coming when he appears in power and great glory, and he establishes his kingdom on earth. Now, it should be obvious to all of us that has not all happened yet. You know, he gives them one, you know, a, a, a series of prophecies. And so they think it's all going to happen at once. In 70 AD is when the temple was destroyed. A million Jews were, you know, destroyed in Jerusalem. But then there's this long period, even in, into our future, because God hasn't, you know, established his kingdom on earth yet. Uh, Jesus has not come back where every eye will see him. And so these things are still future. But as we come into chapter 26, we are getting to the last couple of days before Jesus will be arrested and beaten, then crucified and nailed to the cross. And as we'll see, God the Father has scheduled Jesus to die at precisely 3 p.m. on Passover. Why 3 p.m.? Because that was when all the Passover lambs were slaughtered, according to the Old Testament. This is exactly when Jesus had to die, because from the Father's perspective, Jesus would become the final sacrificial lamb, the final Passover lamb who would die for the sins of the world. So take a look at chapter 26, starting in verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, again, the Olivet Discourse in chapters 24 and 25, that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Now, we've already seen Jesus has told his disciples three times that he was going to Jerusalem throughout his ministry. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be beaten and crucified. And on the third day, I'm going to rise from the dead. And they were clueless as to what he was talking about. Um, they did not understand. Even In fact, in chapter 16, we saw Jesus announcing the same thing. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again the third day. And Peter rebukes him. Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. And then Jesus rebukes Peter. You know, get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God. You're mindful of the things of men. In other words, you're not putting God's plan first. You want your own thing done. Jesus had to go to the cross. He had to die for our sins. The last time Jesus told them that he was going to do, go to Jerusalem and die, they start arguing among themselves, who's the greatest among us? Who's going to be ruling with Jesus in the kingdom of God? And so they're clueless. So even now, just a couple of days before the crucifixion, we'll see that they are still not understanding what Jesus has been telling them. But God's plan all along was Jesus dying. That's the whole purpose for him coming. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son for the purpose of dying. He was sent from heaven to earth to die for our sins. That's the main purpose of him leaving his glory in heaven. So he's the fulfillment of Passover. Remember, Passover was instituted by God way back in the Old Testament, way back in the book of Exodus. It was established when the Jews were still in captivity in Egypt. God had been sending plagues upon the Egyptians telling Pharaoh, let my people go, and he refused. He hardens his heart. The last and final plague would be the death of the firstborn throughout Egypt. And so Moses tells him, and he's like, nope, not going to do it. And so God tells the Jews, this is what you need to do. You need to take an animal, a lamb. You need to sacrifice that lamb. Put the blood on the top of the doorpost, on the two side rails, and when the He's going to send a death angel over Egypt. And this angel, when he sees the blood, he will pass over that house. He will spare the people in the house. That's where Passover comes from. And when he didn't see the blood, that death angel would strike the firstborn throughout Egypt. It was a brutal, horrendous time. So this is why Jesus had to be crucified on Passover. He is the fulfillment of Passover. Look at verse 3. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, 
and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, not during the feasts, lest there be an uproar among the people. Again, notice these religious leaders are very determined to kill Jesus. They're very determined that he not die on Passover because they feared an uproar. They, they feared an uprising because the people love Jesus. They, they don't want to see him die at this point. But again, God is sovereign. His plans will always take precedence over man's plans. Now, by the way, it mentions that Caiaphas was, was the high priest at this time. Caiaphas is the son-in-law of the former high priest Annas. Annas was in the line of Aaron. Annas was a legitimate high priest, very wicked and corrupt, but he was replaced by the Romans with his son-in-law Caiaphas, and they could manipulate Caiaphas even more than Annas. But they were both very, very wicked men, as we'll see. They both want the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, killed. Verse 6, And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask a very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. So we see here Jesus at the household of Simon the leper. He had a wide variety of followers. You know, Simon the leper, obviously he was one of the lepers that Jesus healed and cleansed of his leprosy. It was a horrible disease. Leprosy back then was deadly because... Unless Jesus healed you, you would die of leprosy. It started off by taking all your fingers. It would rot away your nose, your ears. It would take away your feet. And over time, you would just basically your body disintegrate. I mean, it was brutal. And so Jesus healed many lepers. And here's one of them, Simon, the leper. So now they're all gathered at his house. He's serving the Lord. But his followers, they included fishermen, uh, former IRS agents, <laughs> Um, prostitutes that have now been set free from their prostitution. Here we see a woman here, it says, who pours out this very costly, fragrant oil upon Jesus. Um, Mark's gospel tells us this is spikenard. What is spikenard? Well, it's this very, very expensive ointment from India. And it was very, very costly. It's worth, as we'll see, about a year's wage Think of that. This is, a, this is a very expensive bottle of perfume. In John's Gospel, we find that this woman was Mary, the sister of Martha, the sister of Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. We're told in John's Gospel that the disciple who first questions what this woman is doing to Jesus is Judas Iscariot. Take note of this. John chapter 12, starting in verse 4. It says, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? A denarii, one denarii is a day's wage. So it's like 300 days wages. It's like a year's salary. So why was it not you know, sold and given to the poor? Notice, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was in it. So all he could see is 300 days wages, it's being wasted. I could have gotten my dirty little filthy fingers on that money for myself. That's what he's really thinking here. He's thinking this is a big payday. So why is she wasting this on you? So here's the what, <coughs> excuse me, the one who gets the other disciples to start questioning Mary's act of worship here. Yeah, how come you're letting Mary do this to you, Jesus? You could have sold this and given money to the poor people. But that still goes on today. Some people question, why are you doing this for Jesus? Why are you doing that for Jesus? Why don't you get a real job? I had people tell me that before. Why don't you get a real job and make some real money? It's like, you do what God's called you to do. But that just shows their ignorance about the fact that all of us are blessed by the Lord. Every blessing we have comes from the Lord. And everything He's given us, we recognize it's the Lord's. I just want to be a good steward of what He has entrusted to me. We want to honor God with what we do, with all that we have. Mary here is a beautiful example of this. Three times we read of Mary 
at the feet of Jesus. The first time it's in Luke chapter 10, and you know the story. Jesus and the disciples show up. Martha is freaking out, you know, because she starts cooking all this food and trying to prepare a meal for everybody. What is Mary doing? Sitting at the feet of Jesus. And she's just soaking in the word of Jesus, the word of God. And so we read about Martha. She's busy preparing this meal. She's all distracted. She gets all flustered. She comes in and says, Lord, do you not care that I am left here to serve on my own? Therefore, tell her, Mary, to help me. So Mary now, you know, thinks, or Martha's problem is she thinks, you know, she's not getting me any help. I'm upset about this. Her problem, Mary's, Martha's problem, it's not that she's serving. It's her attitude while she's serving. There's a big difference. I've seen people over the years in ministry and just volunteers, they grumble and complain. I can't believe I got to do this stupid thing for God. You know, it's like, are you serious? Come on, you're doing it for the Lord. doesn't matter what it is. You just do it with a joyful heart. Mary or Martha's service isn't the issue, it's her attitude as she served. This is what Luke 10, speaking of her, says in verse 41, Jesus answered and said to her, to Martha, 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 when he says your name twice, you better pay attention because it's like, listen up. You are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. So again, the lesson is this. Sit at the feet of Jesus first. Soak in the Word of God. Be in prayer with the Lord. Get your heart right with the Lord. Then serve the Lord, because then you can serve the Lord with joy, with gratitude, with thanksgiving, instead of grumbling and complaining. So that's the first time Mary is at the feet of Jesus. The second time is when Jesus is on his way to raise Lazarus from the tomb. Martha runs out first. Jesus, why weren't you here? If you would have gotten here when I called for you, you know, our brother wouldn't have died. And then you know how Jesus ministers to her, and, and he says, your brother's going to rise again. Oh, I know, in the last day he'll rise again. He goes, no, no, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And then she asks him, do you believe this? Oh, yeah, Lord, I believe. You're the Christ. You're the living God. You know, and she's all excited. And so she, he says, go get Mary. So Mary runs to Jesus, falls at his feet. So we see her at the feet of the Lord. And here's the third time here as she anoints the head and feet of Jesus. We know from another gospel that when it says he's sitting at a table, that means they're on the floor. They didn't have chairs like we do. They'd sit on a floor around a low table. And so he's sitting there, and she's pouring this costly ointment over his head, and it runs down on her feet, and on his feet. And so it was just a, an act of worship. One of the things I'm looking forward to after seeing Jesus and spending how many millions of years just going, wow, then you get to hang out with all these Bible characters. That's going to be awesome. Mary's going to be easy to smell. Uh, she's the one with the costly ointment, right? So anyway, verse 10 says, But when Jesus was aware of it, hearing their grumbling and complaining, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Surely I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be as a memorial to her. So I like this, because as soon as Jesus became aware of their in indignant response to Mary and what she is doing. He comes to her defense. This is the Lord. He comes to our defense. She's serving the Lord. She's, you know, offering up this act of worship to the Lord. And he is there to come to her defense. He is our intercessor. He is our advocate. Listen, Satan will bring accusations against you. That's what he does. 
You've got people around you, maybe friends or relatives. They'll bring accusations against you. People you work with can accuse you of things. You might have, rightfully so, bring accusation against yourself when you do something bad. But don't forget, Jesus is our defender. He is the one who forgives us. He will stand up for us. 1 John chapter 2. None of us are perfect. We all still stumble and mess up. We're not in his presence yet in a glorified body. So the Apostle John writes, and this is about 60 years later. He's the last surviving apostle. He says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, in other words, yeah, we're all going to sin at some point. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation means he has satisfied the wrath of God that was against us. Jesus satisfied that. He's the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. In other words, even if others condemn you, Jesus will stand up for you. He satisfied the wrath and the judgment of God that was hanging over our lives, and he did it by going to the cross, taking the punishment upon himself that we deserve. So even if others condemn you, Jesus won't. Even if others think your lifestyle, living for Jesus... If they think it's a waste of time, Jesus doesn't see that at all. Here Jesus commends Mary for her sacrificial worship. It's okay if nobody else recognizes what you do for the Lord. We should be doing what we do for the Lord, whether anybody applauds us or, you know, says, boy" or whatever. We're doing whatever we do for the glory of the Lord. Just make sure what really matters is Jesus knows our hearts. He's the one that sees our actions. Here it's Judas Iscariot that leads the disciples in getting them riled up with indignation and in calling this act of worship. He says this is a waste. By the way, Jesus will later call Judas the son of perdition, which is also translated son of wastefulness. So his life was a waste. Here Jesus says that Mary has done a good work for me. This fragrant oil, he says, on my body, she did it for my burial. Just a little bit of spike nard. If, I, if you had a bottle of this stuff, again, it's very, very expensive. You open it up. It wouldn't take very long for the whole room to fill up with this odor of spike nard. She pours a whole bottle on Jesus. I mean, that's just incredible. But think about this. In just a short time, he's not going to take a shower. He's not going to wash it off. They're going to go from this upper room. He's going to get arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. This oil, this fragrant oil is still on him. They're going to start beating him to where he's not even recognizable. I wonder if every time they beat him, some of that fragrance went out from him. They're going to take the whip. They're going to beat his back, 39 lashes. His back will just be like hamburger meat every time they whip him. I wonder if this fragrance just kind of permeated everyone around there. They nail him to the cross, still hasn't had a shower. I mean, this fragrance just flowing. You know, Paul says that we put off a fragrance either of life or of death. Jesus obviously puts off this fragrance of life. This simple but costly act of worship by Mary. Again, it's recorded here in Matthew, in Mark, and also in John's account. So look at verse 14. The one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. So here we have one of the 12 apostles, Judas Iscariot. Again, what a train wreck his life has become. When Jesus sent the 12 apostles out into Israel two by two, he anointed all 12 of them to not just preach the gospel, but to heal the sick, cast out demons, cleanse lepers, raise the dead. We're not told if they did raise anybody from the dead, but he anointed them to do these things. Judas was a part of that amazing time of ministry. And they all came back and they give this great report to Jesus. The demons even, you know, hear us and they flee. And they were just so excited. Somehow, Judas becomes disillusioned with Jesus. He wanted Jesus to set up the kingdom of God, and 
I think the reason why he wanted to be the financial minister of the kingdom of God. Wow, we're going to bring in billions of dollars as the king of kings and the Lord of lords is ruling and reigning, and he wanted his hand in that. We're not told anywhere Jesus is going to make any money. That's just a lie from the pit. But Judas wants that. That's his whole motivation. He's trying to make Jesus into what he thought Jesus should be instead of surrendering his life to the Lord of Lords and letting Jesus make him into the person God wanted him to be. Unfortunately, we still see a lot of people doing that very same thing with Jesus today, just like Judas did. Instead of allowing Jesus, because he's God, and he's molding us, shaping us into what he wants us to be, how many people, how many Christian churches even, and there's a whole group out there that are saying, we're going to tell God what to do. We're going to name it and claim it. We're going to get rich off of him, because I'm a king's kid. And they totally twist the scriptures, and they try to make God subservient to them, what they want. I'm going to speak this out. I'm going to claim these things for myself. We're, that's idolatry, by the way. Anytime you mold God or Jesus into what image and likeness you want him to be, that's idolatry. He's God. He's molding us, shaping us into his image and likeness, what he wants us to be. Huge difference. There's a lot of people that act like Jesus is just a genie in a bottle. Just rub the magic lamp, poof, you'll get your three wishes. That's not Jesus. That's so wrong. Jesus is the Lord over our lives. He tells us in his word how we should live. The more we get to know how good, how gracious, how merciful God is, the easier it is to yield our lives to him. Because that's where a lot of people misrepresent God or they miss understand the Lord, they think, if I surrender to him, he's going to do something horrible with my life. He's going to send me to Africa and I'll be having to you know, live with the pygmies in Africa or something. And, you know, They get all these crazy ideas. No, we trust the Lord. He's going to do what he wants to do that he knows is best for us. So we need to know him. Look at this contrast between Mary, who just poured, like, let's say, $60,000 bottle of perfume over Jesus, she gave her all. She gave her very best to Jesus. Look at Judas Iscariot. He's taking everything he can from God. He's taking everything he can from Jesus just because he wants to line his pockets with money. And here we see him going to these wicked rulers who wanted Jesus dead, and he agrees to you know, betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You know what that is? 30 pieces of silver? That was the price of a common slave. That's how he looked at Jesus. Jesus is subservient to me. He should be my slave. I want to tell Jesus what to do. So he sells him for the price of a slave, instead of realizing he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Look at these verses in Luke 22. This is the same scene here. It says, Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. Again, what a tragic figure Judas Iscariot was. He's also a great example that seeing signs and wonders does not produce salvation. Think about it. You've probably had unsaved family members or friends, and, they've, and I've had people in my life tell me, if I saw a miracle, then I would believe. Really? What's Judas Iscariot's excuse? Spent three and a half years with Jesus, cleansing lepers, opening blind eyes, opening deaf ears. Raising people from the dead, that's pretty good. I mean, miracle after miracle. Every day was miraculous with Jesus in your midst, and yet Judas did not believe. The first generation of Jews, when they left Egypt, they saw the miraculous things God was doing there in Egypt, the plagues, and they finally have the exodus, and they get to the Red Sea. What happens? We're trapped. God just brought us out here to die. No, no. Moses, hold your staff over the Red Sea. It parts. They walk across on dry land. And then God closes it on Pharaoh's army and drowns them all. Miracle. 
They had the fire, the pillar of fire, remember, by night. They had the cloud, the pillar of cloud by day. They had water from a rock. They had manna every day falling from heaven. I mean, they knew the recipes of manna, you know, banana bread, manicotti. I mean, they, they got sick of manna. In fact, they got so upset with God giving them manna all the time. It's like, we've gone through the 101 recipes of manna. Give us something else. And he sends them quail. And it says it was three feet high of quail came into their camp. And they just started shredding those things and eating them. A lot of times they're eating them raw. They're getting sick. I mean, they were just crazy. They get to the promised land, the land of Egypt, uh, Israel. They get to the border. They send in the 12 spies. Ten spies come back with a bad report. We can't go in there. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. Only Joshua and Caleb said, God has given us the land. We just need to go in. And this is only a short time after they left Egypt. But it says they could not enter in because of unbelief. Their unbelief. Even though God was doing all these miraculous things. Seeing isn't always believing, folks. Faith comes by hearing. It comes through the word of God. This is what Peter says, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now, Romans 10, 17, it's kind of our theme verse. I don't know, the Lord put this in my heart 30 plus years ago. And it says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it's the living, powerful Word of God that the Holy Spirit uses to pierce people's hearts with His truth of who He is, what He's done for us. It's the living, powerful Word of God. We need to put our faith and trust in Christ according to what the Word of God says. That's why He came from heaven to earth, according to the Word of God, to die on the cross in our place. Not to make your best life now, not to tickle your ears, not to fill up your bank accounts. That's not why he came from heaven to earth. But he came to die for your sins and my sins. So verse 17, Judas leaves. He's looking for a way to betray him. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? So this is interesting to me. Every Passover that the Jewish people partook in, from the very first one in Egypt until this one, every one of those Passover meals was to celebrate the coming Passover lamb. They were anticipatory, you could say. They all looked forward to the one true lamb of God that would take away our sins. So for all believers in Christ, and there's a lot of Jews who still partake in Passover who are believers, every Passover we do now is looking back to the finished work of Christ as the ultimate final Lamb of God. He has shed His blood for our sins. So now, you and I, we are safe from the death angel. He will pass over our lives because He sees the blood of the Lamb upon us the blood of Jesus. This would be the ultimate Passover as Jesus fulfills all the prophecies concerning Him being the Lamb of God. Look at verse 18. And He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, The time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. Now in Luke's Gospel, we're told that Jesus sent two of His disciples to go and prepare this meal. It was Peter and John. And this is what we're told in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 10. And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Now that's unusual because men didn't carry the water. The women carried the water at that time. So you're going to see this guy carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house in which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So Jesus has already got all these details worked out. And this would also explain why Judas Iscariot didn't have Jesus arrested during this Passover meal because he doesn't know where it's going to be. No, none of the disciples but Peter and John. they got to follow this guy, see where he goes, and then they're going to set it up, get it ready. So 
Judas doesn't know. He can't warn these uh, or alert these religious leaders at this point. Verse 19, so the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Take note of that. Very simple verse, right? Very powerful verse. This is a beautiful verse. Notice it says again, the disciples did as Jesus directed them. That's a powerful statement that all of us who are identified as Jesus' disciples should pay attention to. So often people will say to the Lord, hey, whatever great thing you have for me, I'll do it. Give me some big thing, some big adventure. I'll go to the other side of the world. Just give me the money and I'll go. You know, We have these big ideas, but are we willing to do the so-called menial tasks that Jesus has for us? These guys, like Jesus, tell them, follow this guy. It's carrying water, go into the house and tell, uh, tell the master this. And they're like, okay. And, and they obey the Lord. Are you willing, am I willing, to do those so-called menial tasks that Jesus has for us? Maybe it's giving someone a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. Maybe it's helping somebody with their groceries. You see somebody struggling in the parking lot and they're having a hard time getting something lifted out of their cart in there. You know, be careful when you do that. You know, you don't want to sneak up behind somebody and, you know, say, hey, can I do that for you? You know, they might whack you with their cane or something. I mean, be careful. You know, just make yourself available. You need some help. I can help you with your groceries. Maybe it's just going to somebody that's down and out. You see them on the street corner, whatever it might be. Share the gospel, the good news with them. Whatever the Lord puts on our hearts, are you willing to do whatever he puts on your heart to do? Look at verse 20. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. So they're all gathered here now. Now as they were eating, he said, Surely I say to you, one of you will betray me. So right in the middle of celebrating this Passover meal, he drops his bombshell on them. Truly one of you will betray me. I wonder what's fla you know, flashing through Judas's mind at this point. How does he know? Well, it's all revealed in Scripture for one thing. Jesus knows he's God. Verse 22, and they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? In other words, they were exceedingly sorrowful or deeply grieved in their hearts. And each one of the eleven, not Judas, but each one of these eleven will say, Lord, is it I? I think at that moment they were really being honest with themselves. They're beginning to realize just how weak their flesh is. They, they realize they still have an old nature. They're not born again at this point. They're probably still thinking in their hearts, man, is it me? You know, if we were at the table with Jesus and he looked at every one of us, one of you is going to betray me. I know for me, I'd be like, Lord, is it me? Is it I? Uh-oh. It's also interesting that the first 11 disciples will say, Lord, the, the Greek word is kurios, or master, is it I? We'll see in a second here. Judas is the only one that says, teacher, rabbi, is it I? He did not have that relationship with the Lord. The 11 disciples, they loved Jesus. They saw him as Lord and Savior, but not Judas. Again, he's looking at Jesus as a means to an end, to get what he wanted from Jesus. And they were greedy ambitions he had. He wanted power. He wanted prosperity. Unfortunately, that's where many people are today with Jesus. They only follow him because of what they think they can get from him. Here's an important question that Jesus has for all of us. Luke 6, 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Again, we've looked at Matthew 7, 21 numerous times. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. These 11 disciples knew they were still weak in their flesh. They still needed to depend upon Jesus. And so they're exceedingly sorrowful as they're thinking, could it be me, Lord, who betrays you? Verse 23 and he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him and answered, said, Rabbi, 
Is it I? He said to him, you have said it. So he's letting Judas know non-existence would be better than you, Judas, to have ever been born. That would be a better place to just not exist than to think about the place you're going to spend eternity in. Think about that. At this point, Jesus will identify Judas as the betrayer, but none of the disciples, it's amazing, they still don't clue in. They're all like, is it I, is it I, is it I? Well, it's the guy I dipped this you know, bread in, give it to him, it's him. And they still don't understand that. Even as they give that to Judas, they don't even understand. No, he's talking about Judas. They don't get it. Look at these verses. This is in John 13, the same scene here. He's revealing who would betray him. John 13, starting in verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Who's that? John, the apostle John. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke about who's going to betray him. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. So that's what we just read. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. And then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Now notice, but no one else at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus said to him, Buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. Pretty much just describes the eternal night and darkness that Judas would find himself in, that he's still in today. So at this point, Judas leaves the upper room. He goes to these religious leaders. He's going to tell them that Jesus and the other disciples, they're finishing up Passover, and he knows they're going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where they will betray him, or he will betray him with a kiss. That's where they, they will arrest him there. So as Judas leaves, he's now gone. Jesus is going to introduce to the eleven the new covenant. We'll go through this quickly. Look at verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So notice the first thing he does here. We do this every first Sunday of every month when we take communion. And this is one of the verses we always look at. But he takes bread. Jesus takes the bread. He blesses it. He breaks it. He gives it to the disciples. He says, take, eat. This is my body. Now it's in John chapter 6. I encourage you to write that down. John 6, just remember, go back and read it later. Because... The Jews want to see a sign from Jesus. They want to see a sign, and they say, we want to see like, like what Moses did. He brought manna down from heaven, and they were wrong about Moses. Moses didn't do it. And so this is what we read in John chapter 6, verse 32. Then Jesus said to them, Most surely I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, the manna, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. In other words, only Jesus can satisfy a hungry, thirsty soul. Only Jesus can save someone who is lost. And so this first part of communion that Jesus pictures for us here is that he is the bread of life. Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. And he has blessed us by being the perfect, spotless Lamb of God who would be broken, he would be humbled on the cross for our sins. That's what it means to be broken. Not a bone of his was broken, but he was humbled, broken as he hung on that cross, as he became the perfect sacrifice for us. Then it says he takes the cup, and he gives thanks. He gives it to all of his disciples. 
This is probably the third cup that was used during the Passover. If you've ever gone through a Passover Seder, there's four cups they pass around. The third cup, it's known as the cup of blessing. And this is probably what he's referring to. And he has his third cup, the cup of blessing. Look at this verse in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. The Apostle Paul writes, The cup of blessing which, he, which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So here Jesus brings in this new covenant, which is based on his perfect spotless blood. Again, the old covenant... What was that based on? Well, all the sacrificial animals, blood of bulls and goats and sheep, literally hundreds, I can't say hundreds, tens of millions of animals were sacrificed over the years before Jesus became the final sacrifice for sin. The old covenant was a temporary covering for sin. The, the sacrifice of Jesus would take away our sins forever. The worst bondage anybody can be in is bondage to sin. It's wonderful to hear when people are delivered from bondage of drugs, alcohol, pornography, or whatever it might be. You might be, a, well, probably not in here, but there's places where people are in bondage to other people. Slavery is still a thing. The greatest freedom, though, is found in Jesus Christ. Even Paul, when he was arrested and he was beaten, he was just praising the Lord because he was a slave of Jesus. He was bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. Jesus is offering the disciples, including you and me, this eternal cup of fellowship. As he's passing the cup of blessing around to them, they drink from it, and he tells them, this is the blood of the new covenant. We're going to see, Lord willing, next week when he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he's going to pray there. Three times Jesus prays, Father, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. What's he talking about there? We'll look at it in greater detail, but he's talking about the cup of God's wrath, the cup of God's righteous indignation. If it's possible, let that cup pass from me, Lord. Because Jesus would become the scapegoat in a sense. He would be on the cross taking all the wrath from God that you and I deserve. All the judgment we deserve, he takes it upon himself. This is why he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken in your place and in my place as he hung on the cross. He would be separated from the Father for the only time in eternity as he hung on the cross and died for us as God's wrath was poured out on him. That's why he's praying, if it's possible, let this go. If there's, if there's any other way to save these sinners, Lord, other than me having to be separated from you, for just a short time, but the only time in eternity? That was what caused Jesus to sweat great drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Just the pressure he was under, knowing I'm going to take God's wrath upon myself, I'm going to be separated from the Father, and yet he knew that was the only way. That's why he said, not my will, but your will be done. So he drinks that cup. Now what does he offer us? The cup of fellowship, the communion cup. If you'll come to Christ by faith, you receive His forgiveness for your sins. You allow Him to sit upon the throne of your heart and lead you and guide you from this day forward. Then you will be and you'll experience that He loves you. He has reestablished fellowship between you and the Father. It was lost in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned, but Jesus reestablishes fellowship with God. 1 Peter 1.18 says, Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, you can't buy your way into the kingdom of God, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. After this glorious moment, he institutes the Lord's Supper, communion with them. And then what's it say they do? They leave the upper room. They'll go down the little slope there down to the Kidron Valley. It's not big. It's not a big valley. It's just a little drop off. There's the Kidron Brook and then the Mount of Olives. If you're on the Temple Mount, when we go to Israel, we always go on the Temple Mount. There's Mount of Olives right there. It's called the Kidron Valley. Kidron means the Black Valley called the Kidron Brook, the Black Brook. Why? Because 
250,000 lambs were slaughtered on the Temple Mount every Passover. They're, they, you know, years ago they found these channels off the Temple Mount, and they would just drop the blood onto the rocks below. It'd flow into the Kidron Brook and turned it black with the blood of all the lambs. So here's Jesus leaving the upper room. He goes down the Kidron Valley, up on the other side, and it says they're singing a hymn as they go. What hymn do you think they're singing? They would sing six hymns during Passover, six psalms. They should be more specific, not just hymns. It's six psalms they're singing. The very last psalm they would sing as they finished Passover is Psalm 118. Let's look at Psalm 118. Let's read this and, and just picture Jesus and the disciples leaving the upper room singing this song. It's a messianic psalm, the last one they would sing during Passover. It's on the screen as well, but you can follow in your Bibles. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say His mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say His mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say His mercy endures forever. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me on a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? He's about to be arrested and beaten and tortured. The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire in those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in princes or in senators and congresspeople <laughs> or presidents. It's better to trust in the Lord. All nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. That's a catchy little tune. <laughs> they surrounded me like bees. They quenched like a, uh, were quenched like a fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is the tense of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Who's at the right hand of the Lord? Jesus. I shall not die, but live. Jesus. And declare the works of the Lord. The Lord shall. Uh, the Lord has chastened me severely. Yeah, he was beaten beyond recognition. Isaiah tells us, but he has not given me over to death. He would conquer death. Death couldn't hold him. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. Jesus is the narrow gate that we enter through him. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Very, it's quoted a lot in the New Testament. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. They're singing this, no, and they don't even understand what's going to happen in the garden. They're rejoicing with Jesus. Why wouldn't you? You just had Passover. He just gave you the new covenant. And we're singing that, oh, we're rejoicing in the Lord. And he's about to be betrayed. Verse 25, save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord and has given us light. Jesus is the light of the world. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Jesus would be bound on the cross, nails in his hands. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amazing scene, and more amazing scenes to come as we continue on next time. Let's